Hello, everybody. Thank you, Alexander, for such lovely presentation and guiding us to how to join and solve all of the technical issues on the access to the course. So I'm very glad to start our course with this first theoretical science related uh, session. And today we are starting with the introduction to single cell technologies. However, I would like to make sure that uh, we do not have any crucial technical issues. Uh, that is why um, let's discuss and make a recap of organizational stuff that we have uh, highlighted yesterday. So first of all, as Alexander said, uh, that all of the lectures are streamed on YouTube and uh, already recorded. So for yesterday's lecture, you are already able to access it and rewatch if you need or if you have some questions. Uh, also about the uh, questions and answers format, it will be everything maintained mostly in Slack. So please feel free to write the question related to the course content or some um, uncovered aspect uh, uh, during our course. Uh, and also build the communication with us here. It's literally the main uh, channel uh, to talk to us and figure out if you have some uh, problems. Uh, also, our networking challenge uh, is still open. So feel free to write about yourself introduce uh, your project or your interest to our community and uh, yeah find new your collaborators and uh, new friends in the networking channel uh, also just a very small reminder please do not follow this content of the channel inside the channel so if you would like to introduce yourself do not do this in the uh, channel's name day one day two day three because they are related to the technical uh, or uh, lecture content uh, issues and all of the other uh, topics will be in relevant channels. Also, uh, as we discussed yesterday, uh, our course will have practical part. And yesterday we, uh, or today's morning, to be honest, we closed the registration for the practical part. As you can see, we have uh, 174 uh, responses. And uh, in next uh, two days, we will do the selection process and every participant who will be selected to the um, practical interactive session will receive the uh, email and also uh, will be invited to a, a group in Slack to be able, uh, first of all, set the environment uh, and also uh, get prepared to this interaction. However, participants who will not be selected to the uh, interactive session also able to join us uh, in order to uh, make this build the skills in uh, single cell analysis. Oh, sorry. Um, so if you would like to join, but you were not selected to uh, interactive session, you will have, have any of these instructions. Um, and also, uh, I mean, you will have all of these instructions and also uh, we will guide you in the uh, following our tutorials. So let's start our first lectures. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to present and say, uh, tell you about myself a little bit to make the uh, overview of my background. So I originally, I am originally from Ukraine. I have, uh, I made my master's and bachelor's there, my bachelor's in industrial biotechnology and master's in chem informatics. However, I was studying uh, abroad a lot. Uh, so I had several intense training in different European institutions. Also, I was in a uh, trainship uh, in Max Delbruck Centrum in Berlin, where, where I became familiar with single cell analysis. And recently I started my PhD in the University Medical Center Groningen in a transit program related to personalized medicine. Uh, so in brief, my research projects are, uh, first of all, a single cell multiomics uh, analysis of cohort uh, that we uh, work together here in UMCG. It's a lifelines cohort. Uh, literally, our main task is to do EQTL mapping of uh, the data available, also integrate different molecular QTLs uh, from these participants in our uh, computational models related to gene regulatory networks. In, uh, and th that is why um, we would like to use all of this information to reconstruct personalized single cell multiomics gene regulatory networks as well as re uh, personalized cell multiomics models. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is in brief uh, what I'm working on. And uh, I would like to start with this 
introduction to uh, history of NGS and single cell analysis by itself. So the very basic recap of the single cell analysis is to, to remember that every metazoan organism con uh, consists of the cells. Uh, cells have a nucleus. Uh, nucleus is the main uh, compartment of cells that contain uh, chromosomes and uh, chromosomes are uh, entities uh, where DNA is compacted uh, in. So uh, as you remember from the course of basic biology from the school, uh, DNA is a, a handler of uh, genetic information in our organism. And also another very basic uh, uh, issue that you have to know is the central dogma of molecular biology that uh, DNA contains the information of uh, uh, of inheritance and uh, all of the ge genetic features, but also it uh, could be transcripted, and that is why uh, express this genetic uh, features during um, in RNA, and that uh, which consequently processed into protein. Uh, so that is this very basic recap of single cell biology. And uh, by uh, knowing this information, you have to remember why to study DNA, why uh, to study uh, cells, and uh, like where is uh, what and how you process it. Uh, so in our course, uh, we will talk about, uh, we will cover uh, many uh, aspects of uh, many, like all of these uh, parts of uh, central dogma of molecular biology, but most of uh, the main molecule that we will talk about is RNA. And uh, basically our course is related to single cell transcriptomics. However, other single cell analysis procedures related to DNA processing or information about proteins abundant in the particular cells will be covered on the day three in single cell molotomics techniques. However, that few proteins will be, uh, not few proteins, the small group of uh, proteins that um, is linked to uh, self surface or uh, which have a function as a receptors uh, will be highlighted on uh, Vladislav's lectures tomorrow uh, and Julia's lectures, as I remember. But please follow the program. Uh, yeah, so in brief, uh, all of the single cell technologies became available because of uh, development of sequencing by itself. And the history of the sequencing and DNA discovery started in early. Uh, 20th century uh, by the discovery of DNA structure. Uh, as you can see, the first sequencing in, uh, by itself was performed in uh, 70, 30, okay, 100, uh, 1973 year, 73. I'm sorry, I'm quite nervous today. Uh, and uh, it was a lack of oper operator. Uh, with the uh, flow of the time, uh, sequencing te technologies were uh, developed, uh, and uh, in uh, early uh, 2000, uh, human genomes was sequenced. Uh, so uh, after that, the appearance and like the present uh, presence of next generation uh, sequencing approach were developed, and uh, their uh, Set this set uh, offered uh, huge opportunities to discover DNA features in more advanced level. Uh, this is a very common comparison of Moore's law and also the cost of uh, sequencing per genome, which you can see uh, was uh, even overcame the Moore's law uh, prediction. And nowadays, the sequencing cost, the cost of sequencing per genome, is even lower than it was predicted that uh, actually offer the uh, huge opportunities to do a lot of molecular biology experiments and discover a lot of insights in biological systems. Nowadays, the landscape of single cell technologies is extremely diverse, and this is a poster of, of Illumina. I'm very sorry that is in a bad resolution, but here is the link and I will post the presentation that you might follow. Uh, that this ability to sequence different types of uh, molecules is huge, and that is why uh, this highlights that this set of technology is still on the development. Uh, oh, it was actually the case. And nowadays it's uh, already, it was even sequenced uh, the molecule with more than uh, 2 million ba uh, base pairs uh, in one go using nanopore sequencing. <laughs> However, uh, to distinguish the sequencing development by itself, like uh, which related to 
uh, classic sequencing and also the sequencing which is related to single cell technologies that uh, is the main focus uh, of our uh, course uh, is um, there is actually timeline. So um, in few slides, uh, I will explain the history of single cell technology, uh, but I would like you to know that the classical sequencing that you might uh, find in all of the publication till 2009 actually, but uh, average 2014 will be for sure related to bulk sequencing uh, technology. However, after the advent of single cell uh, approaches, you might follow uh, or might find this particular uh, related uh, articles. So what is a few words about single cell analysis and history of single cell analysis? Uh, the very common comparison of single cell and bulk approaches are, is the follow that if you would like to um, know your the content of your uh, object, you have to decompose it to the uh, very part. And to uh, visualize it in the most uh, convenient way, people very often use such metaphor. So single cell is actually the fruit salad or some kind of that fruit that you might uh, discover and see which kind of fruit, which kind of particles are there, which uh, shape do they have, like which properties, color, taste, and so on and so forth. Um, but with bulk sequencing approach, uh, you will uh, see, you will actually average all of this set of fruits into one uh, portion. And that is why uh, if you would like to have a high statistical power or like if you have operate with this uh, old school method of sequencing, you probably will go through bulk. But if you have the opportunity to discover your object on this cellular resolution, you probably might go to a single cell uh, analysis. And here is how uh, single cell technology were developed. So first of all, uh, these uh, technologies, the uh, isolation of the cell and sequencing uh, of the DNA or like of this uh, nuclear, uh, nucleic acid from one cell were performed by manual isolation of the cells. However, after the, like by implementing uh, these cross disciplinary approaches, uh, the skills uh, that uh, technologies from other fields came to biology and a lot of other approaches were applied. In particular, uh, microfluidics and uh, some kind of robotics were used to perform a single cell uh, sequencing. Uh, for sure, it was necessary because it is obvious that manual isolation of any cell is very time consuming and effort consuming and it will not be uh, performed for a human uh, organism which has uh, more than trillion of cells, trillions of cells. So yeah, on the graph below you might see this uh, amount of growth uh, of uh, these of cells who, uh, which can be captured by different single cell approaches. So now it's possible to capture more than 1 million of cells. Uh, and uh, actually it's even the art to be able to do so. And here uh, in our course, we will try to highlight to actually uh, how, it's, uh, how it could be performed right now. So the popularity of single cell methods is insane. And even in 2013, it was already the method of the year. However, by the development of new branches and some subtypes of single cell technologies, other single cell, uh, single cell uh, tools were nominated by this net methods of the year from nature. So in 2019, it was single cell multi multimodal omics or multi-omics in brief. And in 2020, like almost uh, published a few months ago, the spatial single cell technologies were, uh, was awarded as a method of the year. So uh, for now, it is absolutely clear that the abilities and the um, perspectives of implementation of single cell technologies is insanely huge. So talking about numbers, there are already more than 200 wet labs methods which could uh, be used uh, in order to do a single cell analysis. Here I also uh, attach this uh, spreadsheet with the list of these different methods. However, most widely used methods are few and mm, we will discover them in both our uh, theoretical parts uh, and in lectures and on uh, practice on uh, weekend which is coming. So one of the most popular and widely used technique is dropsic. 
Uh, however, other approaches uh, could be applied. So what you should know about the single cell technology and uh, what we also will highlight in our course is that um, the methods start varying uh, from uh, early stages. So actually from the sample preparation to the, uh, to the library preparation, to the sequencing technology and so on and so forth. But to start with doing single cell analysis, it's easier to follow widely used approaches and already commercial developed kits. So we also will um, explain all of the terms and most of the approaches presented on this slide. We will see after that, that uh, single cell um, analysis is not just a vet lab. In order to be able to find the insight in single cell experiment, you might uh, operate with different computational tools. And now, according to single cell RNA tools, tools uh, resource, there are already uh, more than 800 uh, different approaches available. Uh, the good news is that almost all of these packages and instruments, like frameworks or like independent software, is um, free. So actually, you can use it without paying. Uh, this is a screenshot of single cell RNA tools. And I would like to highlight that even on this uh, huge variety of different computational methods, you already can uh, see that um, they are related to particular aspect of single cell analysis. In particular, uh, of course, there are some basic tools that you use for data processing till clustering in cell identification. We will see that it's actually one of these uh, points uh, that you can uh, uh, say something about your sample. However, advanced methods are also available uh, in the uh, yeah, also already available. And you can do the cell cycle analysis, analysis of uh, cell, cell communication or signaling processing, some gene, regu gene regulatory network reconstructions, and so on and so forth. So I really love this comparison that uh, if you do have some raw ingredients uh, and you would like to find uh, to do something fa fancy for that, you use some recipes. And in comparison with bioinformatics or in uh, single cell in particular, you have your raw data count matrix and then you use uh, different pipelines or independent packages uh, in order to have your, um, your uh, results available. But actually, if you will see, if you look at that from the different perspective, you might ask that if you use different recipes, you will, you will have different results. And the question is how to compare these different results from different approaches that you used. And actually, it's one of the main challenges in this normalization or standardization of data processing approaches in single cell as well. So that is why we also try to make our curriculum this course to, in order to, make, to focus on the most widely used instruments. So let's talk about the general workflow of single cell analysis. Uh, actually, this workflow that we will discover today, it contains six main steps. And the first batch, so the first part, is related to sample processing. About the sample processing, you will hear in, in much more in our second lecture today, which will be related to the workflow of how to process different types of samples. And actually, which kind of procedure you have to apply uh, to uh, be able, in general, uh, come to the sequencing stage. But let's start with some processing. First of all, you do tissue processing. Actually, uh, you can analyze most of tissues, but you have to know which kind of restriction every method or every tissue type require. And as I said, it will be highlighted on other uh, on the second part of uh, presentation today. Uh, yep. Yeah. So by the way, most of protocols for different tissue types are already uh, available. However, te several technical uh, or batch effects uh, appear sometimes, and that is why it is very important to follow the protocol or make this um, problem solving uh, sessions with the protocols provider or uh, your colleagues. So first of all, you isolate the tissue. Uh, and try to process it uh, in uh, the in, uh, in this requirement of protocol that you are going to use. The second stage is related to actually 
um, transferring the tissue from, for example, solid uh, state from this uh, highly interconnected uh, cells to this uh, single cell state. Actually, you have to dissociate your tissue and make it from the solid piece of tissue to the cell suspension. As you know, most of, uh, uh, for example, human tissues are not liquid, and that is why this um, tissue dissociation uh, method is required for uh, most of uh, tissue samples. So there are many uh, different uh, approaches that might be used to do this. So uh, in particular, you can uh, apply some enzymes which uh, break the cell contacts uh, like collagenase and other, or do some uh, technical implementation of e equipment to uh, process and dissociate your tissue. Um, other step is uh, cell enrichment, and this is an optional state. Uh, however, uh, state, uh, cell enrichment is highly recommended to uh, increase the quality of your sample and therefore in your uh, quality of your data, because um, you have to concentrate the particular cells in your tissue sample that you are going to analyze. And also, uh, there is uh, one tricky point that when you do this tissue processing, there is a very rough, rough uh, calculation that almost uh, up to 10% of your cells from this tissue will be analyzed and you will see them in your single cell data set. So to be able to increase this amount of cells, you might go through uh, cell enrichment. And for this, you can um, apply different uh, immunoactive assays or flow cytometry uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So actually these are the main sample processing steps. However, when you are uh, done with that, you go through sequencing and data processing. So this is the more insightful uh, part. Uh, so first of all, you uh, after having your dissociated cells, you do sample uh, like you continue the sample preparation uh, and load your cell into particular into uh, in some equipment to be able to. Um, uh, do the single cell analysis. So this uh, step varies uh, based on this technology that you are going to use. So as uh, you might see on the slides before, there are different approaches. So you can use micro wells where uh, every cell goes to this particular uh, tube or a droplet where every cell is encapsulated in droplet with bit, which we will highlight uh, after that, and also some reagents inside. Uh, so this step requires or uh, contains um, the process of uh, encapsulating every cell to particular isolated form. And these uh, approaches, how to do the cell isolation and mixing with required uh, reagents uh, varies. After that, when you have all of your cells, which already uh, uh, was processed by these enzymatical reactions uh, in, inside a, every droplet or every uh, well, uh, you go, uh, like you can start doing library sequencing and actually start with sequencing approach. So it's a very rough um, comparison. I missed uh, a lot of crucial steps there, but like as it's an introductory lecture, uh, we will also talk about the details in our next sessions. So please do not, <laughs> so please take your time and be ready for uh, other highlights which we will make in, in this course. So uh, about library sequencing, you actually do this uh, next generation sequencing, the history of which we already highlighted. Um, and after uh, sequencing, you do rough data processing and uh, data uh, like consequent data processing, uh, where you look into when you do a genome alignment, when you do a calling of these uh, molecules that you uh, captured uh, in your uh, sequencing, and uh, try to actually play around with this data. So making this data uh, available for analysis is also the set of uh, steps. And uh, what you might do, uh, if, like as an outcome of the step, you might receive the um, overview of the cell types and cell clusters presented in your uh, data set. Uh, there are a lot of tools uh, which, could, which you could uh, use, but uh, fortunately already um, available and useful pipelines are presented. So uh, actually that's all.
Uh, this is a sixth uh, step uh, which you might perform to reconstruct uh, or like perform the single cell analysis. Uh, yeah, uh, the variety of different approaches and the details uh, of uh, most uh, popular sequencing platforms uh, is high. However, uh, every sequencing platform has uh, a lot of uh, in common with other uh, sequencing single cell sequencing approaches. So after isolating yourself, which uh, could be uh, done with different microfluidics approaches or different wells, uh, you do reverse transcription. So one of the most important uh, part to focus and to know about the single cell that uh, in particular single cell transcriptomics operate with, operates with uh, uh, mRNAs and that is why uh, you need a reverse transcription to receive the cDNAs. Uh, so uh, as you might remember from the course of uh, bi molecular biology, every uh, eukaryotic mRNA is poly A tag, uh, is, has a poly A tag uh, tail, uh, which could be tagged by uh, this poly T um, part, which actually builds this uh, uh, bounds uh, and could be therefore uh, matched together. So you do the reverse transcription with particular set of primers, which uh, contains this PCR handle, um, cell barcode, uh, which is unique for any cell and UMI. UMI uh, is a part of this um, of this uh, sequence, which is stands from unique molecular identifier, and actually it says in the further data processing. That that was uh, that actually uh, was coming just from one molecule. So, in brief, in your cell, uh, in your uh, data set, you will have different uh, type of data. In particular, you might know which reads or which information came from which kind, uh, which kind, which kind of cell, and what of which of the cell came from um, which of this information came from one molecule. Uh, so, uh, by counting these um, UMIs and uh, assigning them to a particular type of RNA, RNA you uh, will have the information about the RNA abundance and how many particular types of uh, RNA is presented in your cell. The structure of this, uh, of this primer for uh, reverse transcri transcription varies when depending on the platform. And also, as you remember here, just one of the most popular platforms uh, and could vary as well for other types of technology, which do not focus uh, on the uh, mRNAs, but actually uh, can capture and process even other types of RNA. So after reconstructing DNA during reverse transcription process, um, other step is to do uh, the reconstruction of other uh, strand of this DNA and uh, perform the DNA amplification using uh, PCR. PCR, as you know, is one of the most widely used uh, step in molecular biology lab. So you do this uh, amplification thermocycles and from an amount of um, your DNA, you receive much more uh, uh, DNA in your volume in this solution. And after that, you might go to library uh, construction. Uh, the library construction uh, stage depends on every technology and it will be more relevant to discover it uh, in, uh, one, in this frame in, uh, related to one particular technology. We will do this on our lectures uh, after, uh, later on. Uh, but in brief, to recap the information about the bit, what is a bit? Uh, bits, uh, or who are the bits, um, is, uh, are particular parts of single cell analysis. And actually, it is a small metal or uh, uh, sphere, which is full of different tails, or like some super hairy with these um, nucleotides. Uh, with this uh, sequencing uh, of different um, molecules. And imagine that this is this uh, metal sphere, which uh, has different um, molecules on that. And as I said before, uh, it, it is usually starts from PCR handle that will, that will be used in the PCR step. Also the cell barcode in order to be able to recognize that every bit came from the one cell. And uh, it is important to have 
in your uh, isolated volume one bit and one cell and that is why you will assign the cell barcode to the cell and also every uh, bit will have this multiple different UEMIs. So actually, if you can see here on this, um, on this image, uh, every PCR handle for all of the bits that you will use in your uh, experience is the, the same. Every cell barcode is the same during these volumes. Make sure every cell barcode, the, the sequence of the cell barcode is the same uh, assigned to this bit. And the, every UMI is unique. So actually, that is why it stands from unique molecular identifier. And the other common part with, which will be on every bit is this poly T tail, uh, which will be used for a second strain for capturing uh, mRNA and second stra uh, strain uh, reconstruction. So you can see that just by this, um, using uh, poly T tails, uh, you. Uh, capture the poly A tails of your mRNA, reconstruct the cDNA, and do the sequencing uh, using uh, NGS tools. So just a small recap. There are three main uh, parts, like three main whales of single cell transcriptomics. Uh, first of all, the Lisa solution, which actually makes your tissue or like uh, transfer your tissue from the solid state to the single cell suspension. Uh, other one is the bits and RNA targeting sequences because bits with poly uh, T tails are relevant just for mRNA, which have uh, poly A tails. And also, that is why it might be varied depending on different protocols. And the last but not least is the part of uh, next generation sequencing, which uh, is uh, essential because without knowing, without literally sequencing all of these reads, you will not be able to uh, receive your data. So actually, uh, that is the very small introduction to single cell technology. Uh, I see that we have a lot of time left and I'm glad that I uh, have managed to make it not long. I was worried that it will be overwhelmed with this introductory information. But in general, um, we have a lot of time left to uh, answer on your questions and also uh, to discuss some topics related to uh, this lecture. So in brief, please write all of your questions that you might have in the day one, or um, if it will be related to something uh, very particular, you can post them on general channel or approach me directly in uh, direct messages. Uh, or if you would like to continue or would like to ask me something uh, after the course, I have I like intensively use these social networks. Please feel free to follow me there. So I think that's all. Amazing. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Marina. Uh, we we definitely have some time today before we'll begin the sh very short uh, pause between the lectures, so you can drink some water or, or prepare some tea or whatever. So uh, I, I propose, uh, what if, so we have a lot of amazing questions already and I'm actually updating the question uh, list on the SWAG. So feel free to write it there. As, as it was promised, we will have the questions and answer sessions after both lectures. So both lecturers will be able to answer you, to comment it and to interact uh, a little bit more. Since we have a few more moments before this pause, can we go back to the slides uh, with the steps? Uh, from one to six and maybe to, to make a small play uh, to discuss a hypothetical, very small experiment. Um, so maybe it will be just more uh, uh, more clear for participants how does it work. So I, I also unmuted Vladislav, so I think he is also here. Yes. So uh, yesterday during the networking, I have realized that we had a lot of folks from neuroscience field and from the immunology field. Uh, what, what is your opinion? Which, 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 which example would be easier to, to present with the six steps? I think the most easiest example would be to uh, present blood sample or PBMC okay. isolated samples from blood because it's the easiest to process. So immunology then, then we'll discuss very briefly these six steps uh, in application with the immunological uh, disease uh, or let's say with the disease that's involved in immuno, immuno, immune related cells. So I think leukemia would be a nice example. Uh, so definitely with the source of the tissue, I think let's say human. So I think it's very interesting to, to find the, the actual treatment, uh, new molecular targets, etc. So uh, what can you say me about the tissue dissociation step? Marina, Vladislav, uh, any specifics regarding the liquid tissues here? 
actually the only thing when you want to target some immunological um some immunological moments in the blood that means that you would probably need to isolate a pbmcs so okay, that would so... be the only step that that is required for the tissue processing so just to just just to keep it super simple we invite as uh, patients to en to enroll to our clinical trial or to to the study and we make the puncture and we just take the pbmcs how, how much uh, we cannot what? we cannot take the pbmcs that means okay. the first thing that you take is blood you can okay. take the blood in edta tubes and afterwards you can storage this blood for some time and you need probably to isolate pbmcs from Perfect. the from the whole blood of the patient. So there are some I tricky moments. Can you say more about this PBMC's abbreviation? So it's uh, PBMC is peripheral blood mononuclear cells. That means that you're targeting everything that is in the, uh, that belongs to the white blood cells, to the leukocytes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would have in your suspension lymphocytes, granulocytes, um, and afterwards um, also some smaller proportion of monocytes and so on. Okay, so then you, the, you're getting rid from all of the erythrocytes and thrombocytes that are within your tissue, within your blood cell. Let's cycle. imagine that we have a uh, gradient, have made the gradient signification or any other step to vice red blood cells, for example. And here we go to the step number three, which is cell enrichment. May they be, uh, may they be interested in any kind of cell enrichment and we're talking about leukemias or immune related diseases or anything. Can it be relevant for us? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. you can be, for example, only be interested in the T-cell compartment. So that means uh, you would need to enrich everything that is, for example, CD3 positive, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or some in some other diseases, you may be interested in the myeloid compartment. And so you need to use specific markers for your myeloid cells, which would require some techniques like uh, fluorescence activated cell sort in facts or um, magnet magnetically activated cell sorting like MAX, uh, that what we will be talking about in the second part a little mm -hmm. bit more. Uh, so that so, means you can enrich your, your PBMC uh, as you want. The main point is you need to know what is your question, what are the perfect. main interested cells. So here we go to the main idea that when we are making single cell experiments, we should keep in mind first how we get the sample, but also second, which exact, which exact cells do we want to investigate? Because we actually can enrich for them and sequence mainly the cells. Uh, and that's why we should think one step forward, which is, I think, quite fascinating. Uh, which would be the fourth step? Can we, can we go one slide uh, to the future? Yeah. So, thanks. Uh, so then we will select the single cell RNA seq platform. So I think it's actually quite well discussed discussed in your lecture, what is well, which will be just uh, just in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, and here uh, I would like to tell that we already have a lot of questions already regarding the difference between point number five and six. So I think for this part, specific part, we will stop here and we'll discuss it during the Q and A session because I think many of these things are actually discussed in your lecture. Uh, so if, if the first three steps were not obvious or not uh, clear enough, please feel free to add any questions you would like to. And, uh, and if, if after the second lecture you will, you will still have any questions regarding these steps, uh, then of course we'll be happy to discuss them as well. So what do you think, guys? Should we make the five-minute break uh, before the second lecture? But also we can yeah. answer on some of these. Yeah, there are some of the questions that we can answer now. Okay, then uh, then actually I have summarized the questions on the SOC. So uh, first, third, first question will be, given the cost of single cell RNA seq, is it possible to sequence samples from the limited number of individuals compared to bulk seq? So there is an example, five, five to 12 samples, for example. Uh, do you think our single cell RNA seq can give deeper insights compared to bulk seq with this kind of numbers? Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, that would be basically the question, the, the first part of the, yeah. the question. I think I can provide some of answers because I believe that uh, this question might have uh, several approaches to uh, answer. So the one is that cost of single cell sequencing is much higher than bulk seq. And uh, quite often bulk seq, seq is used to um, support the results of single cell experiments. So actually uh, talking like, coming uh, closer to the answer on this question, you uh, can 
do single cell sequencing for a low number of individuals. And nowadays, I do not remember the single cell experiment with more than uh, 300 individuals recruited. And just because it's a COVID time, uh, a lot of uh, research related to molecular biology was uh, sponsored and that is a single cell experiment related to COVID patients. So it's very often case uh, like um, when you have the analysis, the data, uh, just for a, a small number of patients. Perfect. And the, the last part of this question is, do you think we are at a place now where the single cell RNA seq can become a, just a field standard? Yeah, like it's already in, in the field, I believe. So it's uh, just rely on the infrastructure available in the lab. But uh, a lot of uh, people are already looking into that field. So and. Thanks. And actually, you already answered the second question. If it's possible to combine BAUSIC with single cell RNA seq, yes, that's what Marina just mentioned. Uh, so, the question about the step number four and five what's the difference between two steps? Are they, more, uh, are they both about sequencing uh, or something is not about sequencing? So, what would you say? Um, maybe I would answer because I, I'm, this is like my daily bread in the lab that I'm doing. So, basically, the step four is. Uh, the all the steps that start with your single cell droplets and ending with the DNA with some amount of the DNA library that you have in your tube. So that means that step four leads you to the DNA library that you are preparing in your wet lab experiments. Step five is um, something something in the in the uh, this something something from the other field step five that requires a machine a sequencer machine that can um, that can sequence your DNA library to give you the information about the base that you have in your DNA library. So that means step four is something that you are usually doing in your lab, and the final is the final the final target is to reach the DNA library. And step five, that is something that you are uh, sending to the center that has a um, really very, very expensive machine for sequencing. They are sequencing this DNA for you. And then you can get an output as a list of the bases that you have in your probe, in your sample. Mm -hmm. well, okay. okay, the next question will be not about the computation or maybe a little, no, actually it's a little bit about that. Do all mRNA molecules from a single cell have the same UMI? Uh, which Marina mentioned uh, on one of the slides. So I think it was it, it was already answered, but maybe it's better to yeah, comment it for everybody. Yeah. So uh, as it's it was said, UMI is unique molecular identifier. So the every molecule, like independent molecule, uh, will have its UMI, but every molecule type will not. So I mean, if you are tagging, uh, if you are looking into one particular uh, mRNA, probably is not just the one molecule, but in this case, you will not see it in the data set, but it will be some uh, amount of this molecule which you will have with this UMI. So I hope I answered. Yep, and we still have a few more questions regarding the UMI. So for example, uh, is uh, RGMI used to determine the final data set, what type of RNA is present in the cell? That's an interesting question. Uh, I think I, I, I really, uh... Okay, um, so UMI uh, is used in this uh, raw reads processing and this um, reads calling when you count the uh, numbers of uh, the UMIs for particular type of RNA. Uh, and that is why in your final data set and that data count matrix, which we will work with on our practic uh, practice, uh, you will see the type of um, uh, mRNA actually. Thanks. So I think this definition would, would provide the better um, insight on how, how does UMI work. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Okay, so there's also a computational question. Uh, I can already answer that all these specifics like P PSA, TSNE, UMAP, and so on will be discussed during the workshops. So don't worry, you will receive this information during the course, uh, but not today in these two lectures. So uh, this, the next question would be, 
can you do single cell RNA seq on frozen tissue? I think it's actually something we would discuss during the second lecture, right? Yeah. 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 So that's a good question. And uh, there is a tricky answer to that. So during the second lecture today, you, you will definitely receive some insights. A uh, very interesting question from uh, from the person who actually works with bioinformatics. Is there any tools that can estimate the sample size of the single cell seq? Uh, I, I, I think it's about the experiment, uh, experimental setup. I personally, for me, it's also a, an interesting question. What do you think, guys? Any yeah, tools I, for, for uh, to, uh, to estimate the sample size uh, of the single cell RNA seq? That's, that's a very good question. Basically, yeah. um, what I would recommend you to do is to sort samples before you are doing any library experiments, if you have a lot of cells, because that would help you to estimate the number of cells that are going into the analysis. So that would be the best to proceed. Like the, you sort only 10,000 of cells and then load 10,000 of cells into your chip. And then you can estimate that 5,000 of these 10,000 would make it to the final data library. That would be, um, yeah, I think the best okay. way that best way increase, to handle this question. Increase the difficulty of this question because I'm not sure whether it was related to the cell number or the experimental setup. For example, I want to study leukemias, right? And I have treated patients versus untreated patients. What is the sample size of the patients I actually need to in, in, uh, include in the study and how many patients should they, should they even sequence? So I, I personally don't have a good answer to this question. Maybe you guys have. <laughs> Yeah, so I know by heart that the packages were some tools which help you to do this preliminary calculation. They exist. So mm -hmm. uh, and it's better to literally Google something re directly related to your uh, research of interest topic. So there is some, uh, some, some participant has already provided the name Scopit. I personally didn't work with that, but I'm a little biased here because we, we mainly work with rare diseases. So we sequence everything good. But probably with not rare diseases, it's not uh, the same. Uh, yeah, but yeah. that's very I mean, interesting to estimate regarding, the power. Regarding the sample size, it, especially in such techniques as single cell RNA sequencing, it always depends on the amount of money that you have. Let's mm -hmm. say it really clear because it's very uh, cost efficient uh, method and it uh, costs really a lot. So that's why uh, it depends on the budget that you have in your lab. But I would suggest that you should minimally have n is equal three or n is equal five in each of the group that you're investigating. Super nice that you mentioned funding because funding because actually the next question would be related to funding. Uh, if if the funds uh, so if you're limited in money, would you include more individuals or rather increase the depth of sequencing? That's a nice question. Mm, I would say. Uh, I would include more individuals on the to, uh, to 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 increase the power that I'm that I would have then statistically in the analysis. I wouldn't use some individuals just to increase the depth because at the end when you find only one subset of the cells in one patient, it's statistically insignificant and you cannot sell it to the reviewers. So um, the only the only the only explanation to increase the number of patients would just to increase the power of your of your analysis afterwards in the statistical part. Yeah, so what's, your, what's your opinion, Marina? Yeah, and that's the reason why a lot of single cell experiments are supplied by bulk sequencing, because the statistical power of single cell analysis is uh, quite weak. And uh, you have literally in your final data set, a lot of dropouts and you it's difficult for you to say that the effect that you discover is statistical uh, important, like statistically yeah. significant. Uh, and also, yeah. Uh, I just uh, would like to mention that talking about um, this breach about bulk uh, sequencing and uh, single cell RNA, there is a set of the tool which might uh, which can do some kind of deconvolution of bulk sequencing in, and uh, impute these uh, cell types and the proportion of the cell types with this assigned uh, expression matrices for single cell state. So if you uh, would like to make the computational analysis and you can operate just with bulk sequencing data available in your lab, you already can use a lot of tools to do this very draft uh, artificial experiment to, of this uh, deconvolution of bulk sequencing samples. To Makes sample. sense. Also depends on which, which exactly genes uh, or group of genes are looking for, because if yeah. you're looking for low abundance transcripts, probably it also makes sense to think about the depth. 
However, I would mm -hmm. also prefer at least to increase the number of individuals if it's funding. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. at it's... the end, when you will have really only one patient with some subset of the cells, cells or some subset of the genes out of, I don't know, three or five patients, it means statistically nothing. So, yeah. That, that would be nice to have a good power in your experiments because yeah. otherwise you cannot publish that. <laughs> yeah. And also uh, the question more about the biology of that. So uh, we have thought, uh, we have discussed the mRNA, uh, poly-A enrichment or poly-A poly capture of mRNA. And mm -hmm. Stanislav asks, what about other types of RNA? How is yeah. it possible to catch those molecules, which are mm -hmm. obviously without poly-A nails? Yeah. So there are several protocols available for uh, the sequencing of other types of RNA. And instead of using poly uh, DT tails, uh, you can use a randomized, uh, this uh, set of uh, random primers. So you used uh, um, these uh, structures without a poly DT tail. Uh, I recommend you to go to SmartSeq uh, protocols, as I remember, it's uh, the most relevant one. And uh, or just please contact us in this Slack, and we will provide you with these materials. However, I remember as well that several protocols were uh, linked to uh, discovery of circular RNA and other types of uh, minor RNA that you uh, might be interested in. So protocols are available, but we will not cover that uh, in our course intensively. Yeah. And, and mainly, I mean, most of the time you actually want to mainly estimate or analyze the mRNAs, yeah. which are with, with poly This is the logical state of the cell, and that is why they are like these biological markers and uh, it all together make the snapshot of the cell state, cell type, and cell uh, interaction, and even some kind of uh, um, potential of, of the cell to be developed in other cell type or uh, become dead soon, and so on and so forth. That's uh, perfect. Another question we have, is, I think we have to some time for one or two questions. What is the connection between the UMI-based libraries and batch effect? So do you think there's any connection, um, any opinion on that? Let me think. Uh, yeah, I just did not understand the question properly, but uh, is the question about if you have really a lot of UMI, is that you might have more represented libraries or? Uh, sorry, uh, why this one was muted. Uh, now I think I pressed the button. Yep. Okay. Uh, so uh, the question the question is posted on the channel by Ilya. I think uh, if, if you will go there yeah, and read it I think it's, it's a very, very good question mm -hmm. to speak about batch effects on itself. I mean, um, we need to understand what is the batch effect at the beginning. Batch effect is the effect that is caused by the processing of the tissue that you're working with uh, or processing of the sample, even how you are pipetting and etc. cetera. It um, can cause, of course, some stress for the cells or it can damage some cells and the other not. And that's why all of this processing uh, bias can be uh, summarized together as batch effect in that case. On the other hand, even the number of cycles that they are using for the amplification uh, in the next steps when you're working with the cDNA can also cause some batches. Yeah, when you amplificate a little bit more in one sample and the other sample you're amplificating a little bit less. So basically the question that you are asking us, is Yumi uh, based method, can it bring a batch effect with itself? Of course it can. I mean, it depends of on your sample processing and depends on the number of cycles you are using. And at the end, uh, yeah, the, the only way to avoid your batch effect is would be to standardize all of the protocols that you are using. Sounds like a tough task, isn't it? <laughs> um, and then we have a lot of questions regarding tools. Uh, I think so. Uh, again, the questions regarding tools are actually very nice questions. I think many of these questions will be answered during the workshop, the, the hands on practical sessions. Uh, so right now we will not discuss those. However, one question I would, I would like to specific, specifically highlight um, uh, is there so the question is about the quality control checks. Yeah. Uh, do you know any standard guidelines in single cell RNA seq for the quality control, like the hitchhikers' guidelines for yes, something? Yes, of course. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, when you're, for example, working with the 10x protocol that we will also discuss in detail in the second part uh, today, you have uh, 
after some crucial steps of this protocol and a quality control step uh, on which you have a possibility to measure the cDNA concentration and also to run some bioanalyzer um, um, experiments to, to see what is your DNA concentration and whether you have some contaminations or not. Mm -hmm. So in the library preparation workflow, you have like three or four quality control steps where you can see whether your library preparation was successful or not. Yeah, as well as on the tissue processing, like you might know how many cells you have in your sample. So it's actually yeah. every of the step uh, till uh, sequencing by itself, you have this breakpoints to be sure that you have cells, everything is correct, you follow the protocol and you have yeah. the proper amount of uh, reagents and so on and so forth. So if we can, for example, we can separate like quality control in three major topics. Like the first quality control, as Marina said, would be a pre-processing of tissue. You can, for example, uh, fax your cells and using uh, some of the viability dye reagents to see whether your cells are dead or not dead. Yeah, that would be like the quality control in the pre-processing step. When you are talking about the DNA library preparation, the most quality control steps would targeting the DNA concentration, what you are getting and the uh, mm -hmm. bioanalyzer results, whether you have some contaminations from the other DNA length or not. And the third step of the quality control would be the bioinformatical quality control. Mm -hmm. That means when you are analyzing your data with bioinformatical methods, you have a possibility to discard the cells that are dead, that um, have very low amounts of genes expressed and so on and so on. So you have like the three major points of quality control steps in your single cell analysis. Sounds cool. And we have five minutes before the beginning of the next lecture. I think uh, if there are any questions left, uh, if some participant would like to answer something else, please write it on, on the Zoom channel. Uh, we will have the, some time after the second lecture, so we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and let's make the five minutes break so we are able to drink yeah. some water, prepare some tea, and meet you here in Zakaria in the same Zoom meeting in five minutes. Just since I'm anyway here, uh, I will answer a technical question which was asked in the channel. So we are not providing certificates for, for the session because it's not affiliated with any institution or university and we're not collecting any assessments of your knowledge after that. It's something we will definitely make in the future or think about making in the future for the future schools. So for this school, you will just receive knowledge and uh, we'll be able to communicate with your colleagues and extend the professional network. And since you're still, uh, so for those, for those of you who are anyway here, uh, feel free to refer to the networking channel. Uh, here you can write the links to your LinkedIn or your Twitter, and maybe provide a few keywords about yourself. So for example, I wrote uh, the school's lecturer, medical doctor, PhD student, and liver disease. So if any fellow participants are looking for uh, any any opinion on liver disease and single cell, maybe they can find me like that about uh, just researching on that. So if you want to share it, please also write a few words about yourself there um, and it will be easy to find you after. For example, I've seen a lot of people who uh, work on the neuroscience and I think it would be nice to uh, communicate with each other after that. At least for me, it would be interesting to, to find other liver people uh, on the community. So it would be nice also to mention that. And in approximately three minutes, we will continue with the lecture number two.
So I think uh, since we're still waiting, we can just share the screen. I will I will make you presenter. I think now you can share the screen. Yeah, amazing. And we have uh, one more minutes. So the question in the chat is, I see till how long it's for today. We plan it to do till 8 p.m. CET. So that means we will have like maybe 40 minutes of theoretical material left for us. And then we'll um, dedicate maybe 15 or 20 minutes for the Q&A sessions. Okay. So it's Perfect. already 7 p.m. and I, pro I, I transferred the microphone to what is wealth and the stage is yours. So thank you very much, Alexander. On this point, I would also um, be very grateful and say thank you to Marina for such an incredible talk that you made and for the very interesting first part of our presentation today. So first of all, also a great thank you for all of the participants that are interested in our single cell course and that are attending now all over the world from different timelines. Uh, thank you very much. And that's why I will, not, um, I will not do it very long and try to cut it short. So a um, few words about me. My name is Vladislav Kavaka. Um, I am fifth year medical student uh, studying at the Ludwigs Maximilian University of Munich in Germany. I come originally from Ukraine and uh, since beginning of 2020, I'm doing my doctoral thesis at the Institute of Clinical Neuroimmunology in Munich. So neurosciences and immunology have always fascinated me. That's why I landed into the uh, research of the multiple sclerosis and especially uh, uh, of early stages of the multiple sclerosis. So um, in my doctoral thesis, I'm using a lot of single cell RNA sequencing techniques and also other multi-omics techniques on top to, um, to, to provide the, the necessary information for, about the early steps, the early types of the multiple sclerosis. And um, the, the very interesting point of our working group is that we combine wet lab experiments with bioinformatical analysis steps. So that means that we are doing our DNA libraries and also bioinformatical analysis by ourselves. And that's why I hope that today's part that is uh, referring to the more wet lab part would be very interesting for you and will give you some insights into how can you proceed with your own experiments, which approach you should take to uh, make your DNA library in the most efficient way. So before we start, I would um, answer maybe the very important question in this case, why should we use the single cell RNA sequencing? Why is this technique so hot now and why everybody is seeking to um, know a little bit more about the technique? The first point is, of course, that um, the technique is allowing you to use a very high throughput and that's why you are getting a large amounts of data generated. So that means with one experiment, you can gain really a lot, a lot of data. And um, when you are doing the bioinformatics analysis of your data, it allows you to use mostly the unsupervised methods that would be statistical, statistically appropriate in that case for discovering, for example, novel cells populations or with this unsupervised method, you can even discover new markers for diagnostics or therapy in case of some diseases like multiple sclerosis and et cetera. Or um, you can discover new possible intercellular interactions. And um, that is a very, very nice technique, as you see, with a lot of benefits, with a lot of data generated. Um, and with a lot of possibilities afterwards to work with your data. 
but all of this nice stuff can be only possible in that case when you can prepare a, a good library, a good DNA library. The pre-processing, the wet lab part is a very important part. That's why it's necessary to know how should you handle with your sample? How should you proceed with your tissue? Um, before we start, I would like also to emphasize that we don't seek for a hundred percent completeness in our workflow, okay? As Marina showed, there are more than 80 different uh, sequencing approaches that you can use. There are a lot of techniques and technologies that are available and we are not seeking to include them all in our pipeline today. Uh, what I will be focusing on are general steps, general questions that you will have during your planning. And what I will be focusing on are more commercial kits that are available now on the market. Yeah, so that means we will not discuss each and every uh, uh, pipeline of the sequencing, but rather focus on the on that ones that you would use, I think, yeah, on, the, on that one that are commercially available now. So let's start. And the first question, of course, that you would have working with the with your sample is, of course, with which tissue type do you get? Yeah, that is a very crucial question because at the very beginning you should decide before planning your experiment. Okay, am I working with a fresh tissue or am I working with the frozen preserved tissue? And in that case, let's start with the ones that is a little bit easier to handle. Let's start with the fresh tissue. So let's decide we have fresh tissue. And the next question that you will handle is of course, what is the tissue state that you have? Are you working with solid tissues like tissue blocks or are you working with the liquid tissues? Some of you have been asking in the chat also before what are the most frequent uh, samples to process with the single cell RNA sequencing technologies. So the most frequent that you will be working with uh, is liquid. I mean, a lot of the single cell RNA sequencing uh, pipelines are focusing, for example, on processing of blood like DBMC samples or what we are doing in our research, we are also processing the uh, cerebral spinal fluid of the patients with multiple sclerosis. So um, a lot of them are just focusing on liquid tissues, but of course you can plan your experiment that you will start with the solid ones. So let's start with the easier one. We have fresh tissue and we decide that we are working with the liquid fresh tissue. Yeah. What is the next question that you should ask yourself? Yeah, that's of course, uh, do I need to sort my tissue? Like we discussed with uh, PBMCs in the first part. And what is the quality of my tissue? Do I have, may I have some part of the dead cells in the tissue? May I have some part of the cells that I don't want to include in my analysis? So as you see, we are going with the way of the less resistance <laughs> to begin with. So let's decide that we don't need to sort our tissue. That means no sorting needed. And we, in that case, when you, when you really um, have, um, case that you have fresh liquid and not sortable uh, tissue, that is the case that you want a jackpot because you can really proceed afterwards to the, for example, 10X single cell library preparation workflow. So what is it? 10X is a commercial kit that is available on the market and it's a very, um, very, very common pipeline used for the single cell RNA sequencing. So. Uh, what do you need for this library preparation workflow? The first thing that you need is money, really a lot of money. It's um, it's cost. The cost of the 10x library preparation is are very high. You may uh, um, maybe count like with uh, three thousand euros per sample, and when you add up the sequencing cost on top, you may come like to five or even six thousand euros per sample that you would need to spend for this method. But the outcome of this method is really great. You will uh, get a high number of genes per cell if you, you have done your uh, library preparation correctly and uh, you would gain a lot of data from this method. So um, the second thing that you need for this method is of course uh, a machine that is doing the microfluidics for you. So that's why let's imagine we have our samples we have our, our fresh liquid samples with cell suspensions. 
and uh, we can load it onto the 10x Chromium controller machine. What's, what is the next? What happens next? The next thing that is happening is that in this controller, you have a lot of tubes that are working by the microfluidics principle. So that means you have a lot of tubes that each of them has its own flow. For example, in this tube, you can see only the cells floating. In the other tube, you can see the oil floating. And in the third tube, you can see a lysis buffer with microparticles floating. So, and the point is of this microfluidics, um, microfluidics uh, principle to mix the three flows with each other in such a way that you can get a single cell droplets in the output. So let's discuss what does a single cell droplet contain? What are these single cell droplets? So you can see a wonderful painting of mine that I was doing here in the PowerPoint. Uh, this is a droplet, as we can see in blue. And each of such droplets would contain ideally one cell and some of the particles inside. So the uh, ingredients that we need to have in our droplets are the cell, a lysis buffer that will um, that will dissociate the membrane of the cell and release all of the insides of the cell and the enzyme mix and microparticles with beads. That is the thing that is contained in each and every droplet. So I would like to repeat once more what uh, Marina has told you already in the first part of our seminar today. What are these beads? What do they, what do, they do? So as you understood in each of the droplet, uh, is one cell that is contained in it. So that means when we are lysing the membrane of the cell, all the containings of the cell will just be released into the, into the buffer and into the droplet on itself. And um, especially what, is, what we are interested in are of course the RNA molecules that are contained in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, the beads that are also contained into the droplet that have this particular structure that we already uh, that we already um, discussed, will bind the messenger RNA molecules with the help of the poly T sequence at the end. As Marina told you, the eukaryotic messenger RNA molecules, they have a poly A tail at, at the three prime end. So that means each uh, of the molecules can be targeted with the poly T sequence of the beads on itself, yeah? So that means we will bind the messenger RNA molecule with the help of the poly T. The next thing that is coming in the beads are of course the uh, UMIs. UMIs are the unique molecular identifier. So that means for each of the binded messenger RNA molecule, we will have a unique molecular identifier. And the next thing that comes up here in the primer is the cell barcode. As we discussed before, each of the cells, so that means each of the droplets would contain the same cell barcode. So that means per droplet, we would have the same cell barcode that will allow us to trace the cell that is contained in this droplet. And the PCR handle will be binded by the enzymes at the end and by the sequencing and so on. So basically, what does this matter to allow, allow, allow us? First, we target the messenger RNA. Yeah, we target the whole messenger RNA contained in the cell. Second, you can label your messenger RNA with a specific primer, so it can be traced afterwards after the sequencing steps of the DNA library. And the third, of course, that you will have the cell barcode that will allow you to deconvolute to uh, to to. Um, to, to get the information about the cell where this messenger RNA molecule uh, was being detected. Okay, so this is are the, the crucial points that we just needed to repeat once more. And um, that's why uh, we will go to the next step and um, try to understand what is happening afterwards. As you may see, the droplets are containing also the enzyme mixes. Yeah, so that means we have some enzymes that will do some work for us afterwards in the next step. So, and basically when you are ready with the microfluidics machine, you will get at the output of this 10X controller a suspension of your single cell droplets containing beads, messenger RNA binded, and also containing some enzymes. And that enzymes will do in the next step 
the following. You will do the reverse transcription of your messenger RNA. And on top, you will do the PCR. So that means you will amplify everything, the output of your reverse transcription. So why do we need to do a reverse transcription of the messenger RNA? So let's remember a little bit about the, um, about the basic molecular biology. Um, as you may know, the reverse transcription is a process where you synthesize from the messenger RNA the DNA, yeah, the complementary DNA. So that's why we call the product of this reaction cDNA. And um, we are doing it in the DNA matter because the DNA, as you may know, is more and more stable. Yeah, you don't usually work with the RNA on itself. You try to uh, to, to, to convert it into the DNA because DNA is much more stable. It, it is really uh, much more easily to handle it and to send it afterwards for sequencing, okay? So the output of this RT-PCR will be the cDNA. And in the next steps, what we will do, we will just amplify the cDNA molecules. We will cut them in small pieces um, in order to fragment them to make small fragments. And afterwards, after some quality control steps and purification, you would have hopefully a nice gene expression library. So basically the output of this method would give you a DNA molecules that contain information about the whole messenger RNA molecules that are contained in your cell, okay? So that means that um, the library from each and every sample would contain the, um, the, the messenger RNA information of each and every cell that you have in your sample. And this DNA that you will uh, get after your experiment in the wet lab, you can send for the sequencing or sequence it on your own if you have the sequencer machine in your lab. And after the sequencing, you would get probably just uh, um, a very, very long line of the base of the basis of the nucleotides that are that, that were detected in your sample. So this is once more an answer to you. What is the difference between step three and step four that you were mentioning in the first part? So step three ends here. You have the gene expression library. You have some amount of the DNA that you generated. And the step four, the sequencing, is something that is coming on top. Yeah, that is something that is being done by the sequencer machines and, that, and in that case, you gain the information about the nucleotides that you have in your samples. So um, let's come to the next point. Let's come, um, let's go a step backwards. Let's think about uh, the question whether we need to sort our tissue, yeah? When, uh, when we need sort uh, and quality control our tissue. So this is a little bit more complicated. This is, uh, this is something that requires you additional pre-processing steps. So let's discuss it a little bit. Let's imagine that we have a fresh liquid tissue that we need to sort. Uh, so the most common sorting techniques may include, as we already discussed in the, third, in the first part, the max sorting and also the effects sorting. So with the help of max sorting, you can label your cells with the uh, magnetically activated antibodies and um, you can sort yourself with the, uh, your cells with the help of these magnetically labeled antibodies uh, in a way that you can enrich, for example, a population of uh, healthy cells or a population of healthy and T cells and so on and so on. So you can build down your panel and enrich only the, um, the cells that you need to target in your sample. So as uh, soon as you have done it, you can of course make a cell suspension out of it, like a liquid where all of your cells are suspended it. And then you can put it into the 10X chromium machine and proceed with the standard, uh, with the standard protocol that uh, uh, I have um, been showing you for uh, on the previous slide. So this is the max sorting. You can also sort your cells with the help of the FEX sorting, with the fluorescency activated cell sorting. That means that you are um, mixing your cells with antibodies that have a fluorescency signal in it. And depending on this fluorescency signal, you can sort your cells 
uh, into one or another direction. For example, you can you can you can build your own panel that is containing um, some markers for healthy cells, and afterwards you can sort only cells that are CD3 positive. Yeah, and in that way you would gain like the most of the cells in your sample would be only the T cells or T lymphocytes. Yeah, and so on and so on. So with the help of specific panels of the fluorescency labeled antibodies, you can sort yourself cells with the help of the facts. And the next question that you can put yourself is, of course, how much money do I have? So uh, you, as you, as you, as you understood before, the 10x um, uh, pre preparation workflow is pretty expensive. So if you have a lot of uh, budget, if you have high amounts of budget that you can invest in your research, you can use the 10x single cell RNA sequencing approach. So if you don't have so much money, but you still want to have a really good and sensitive approach that allows you to uh, do the RNA sequencing on the single cell resolution, you might maybe look onto the other methods that can be uh, represented on the market and that are commercially available. And I would like to present you one of such methods that we were also using in our lab. Uh, so if you don't have so much money, so if you don't want to spend a lot of money for your reagents, uh, you might maybe look into the other uh, method that is giving you really a good sensitive results. And that might be SmartSec2 or SmartSec3. So let's talk a little bit about that. What is SmartSec library preparation workflow? What are these regions? So basically what I said, for using SmartSec on the single cell, uh, resolution, you need to uh, sort your single cells. Yeah, you need to separate your cells into the single cell droplets. Yeah, you can do it, for example, using fax and using uh, 92 well plates where you can sort in each well plate only one cell. Yeah, so basically, when you sort it with the fax, you would have as an output a plate with 92 wells, and in each well, you would have uh, one cell per well. So basically you have single cell well plates here in 92 resolution. And SmartSec is a, is a whole transcriptome uh, protocol that allows you to uh, synthesize the messenger RNA library out of anything that you have, yeah? So that means you can have a bulk of cells, but you can also have a single cell in the droplet and you are making in each and every droplet the SmartSec reaction. So that means that in each and every droplet, you would use reagents to target the messenger RNA. And you would be basically doing the same that we described before. You will convert your messenger RNA into the DNA yeah, in each and every droplet. So afterwards, you can amplify, fragment, and purif purify your, um, your uh, library. And uh, in the best case, you would get a very um, sensitive gene expression library of each well that you have in your 92 well plate. So basically, what are you gaining with this method? You are gaining a whole transcriptome gene expression library afterwards that is pretty sensitive. And regarding the costs, it's, the costs for it are much, much lower as you would do in 10x. But as you may understand, the throughput that you will have will be also lower. Yeah, when you can load, for example, 10x uh, for 10x like 10,000 cells or 20,000 cells, you can uh, you will gain per uh, workflow here per one line maybe 92 well played cells and so on. Okay, so that means the throughput is lower, but the costs are, uh, are also lower in that case. And afterwards, you are getting really good libraries that you can send for sequencing. So what I wanted to show you is that um, you just need to, uh, to look how much budget do you have, which method you want to prefer to use, which, um, which machines do you have in your life. Maybe you don't have a fax machine or you have a fax in the, uh, in the core facility that you need to book and so on. So just think about it, think about your uh, experiments before you are planning them, yeah? So let's summarize everything that we were talking about now. So we have um, started We have started here with the fresh versus preserved tissue. And we said that the most easiest part would be if we will start with the fresh tissue and 
with the liquid fresh tissue. So the next question that we needed to ask ourselves would be the quality, whether I need sorting or I don't need sorting. So if you don't need sorting, you can load your, um, your cells onto the 10X Chromium chip and then do a simple library preparation according to the 10X protocol. If you need sorting, you may think about FAX or for example, MAX. I saw a question, for example, in the chat that uh, some people are asking what is more accurate, FAX or MAX? So that's a very, very good question. Um, as you may know, all of these techniques like FAX, for example, yeah, they are working with the microfluidics and they are working with the cell strain and so on. So that means that when you're working with FAX, you are, you are putting yourselves through a very high amount of stress that can of course affect your analysis afterwards. Yeah, so that means uh, if you are faxing your cells and faxing them long, that means that you are stressing your cells a lot and it can, um, it, it can um, deflect also on some of the genes that you will see in your library. Okay, so that means faxing is stressful for cells, but faxing is uh, pretty accurate. Yeah, if you have a lot of gating mechanism like you gate uh, first of all on the healthy cells, and afterwards you can gate only the uh, you, you will gate only the cells that uh, are in the leukocyte compartment, lymphocyte compartment. Afterwards, you can gate only CD3 cells. Out of CD3 cells, you can gate CD4 or CD8. Afterwards, you can split them in naive and and uh, not naive, and so on and so on. What I'm trying to explain you facts is uh, very useful in in the moments when you're using a lot of the gating steps afterwards. So it might be something to consider when you uh, are gating a very small cell populations that need a lot of steps to be gated. MAX on the other hand is also a very good technique. And if you are using a negative enrichment, so that means that you are sorting everything that is not binded by the antibody, it's even something that is very good to be used because you are not stressing yourself. Yeah, When you are using the negative selection with the help of MAX, that means that you are introducing much, much less pre-processing batches as if you would do it with effects. But as I said, it's the matter of the question. Yeah, Do you need to sort a cell population that is that can be done in one or two steps or you need to sort a cell population that is very small and is based on a lot of the markers? So MAX can be stressful too, as I see in the chat. Yes, of course, but you can gate with the help of the MAX, the cells that are not binded by the antibody. So you, mean, you can make a negative selection with the help of MAX, which means that you will stress your, your cells uh, much, much less as you would do it with effects. So um, I saw also a question when you say liquid tissue, is it just blood or spinal fluid or includes cell suspensions or for example, liver cells? Very good question. Uh, when, I'm say, when I'm talking about the liquid suspension, that means that I'm talking about um, a liquid with suspended cells in it. So it can be blood or uh, spinal, uh, spinal fluid, or it can be also uh, a tissue that has been um, uh, dissociated and then um, when and, and then resuspended in the in the liquid. So I mean in that case also the cell suspensions over the tissues that uh, were dis dissociated uh, before. Good. So as you see, here are the is the scheme that we were talking about for the fresh samples, for the fresh liquid samples. And as you can see, there is a whole branch that is missing here on the left part. So what what uh, what do we do when we have a solid tissue? Yeah, what is what is what is what is the pre-processing of the solid tissue, and what are the questions that you should put yourself before uh, performing your experiment? So the third thing that you need to understand is whether you need the special information. Okay, so that means whether you need the information about the position of the cell in the tissue. Because when we are talking about the cell suspension and dissociation, that means that all of the special information that was included in the sample will be lost. So let's um, imagine that we don't need this information, that we just need to 
have an information about the cells that are contained in our tissue. It may be, for example, a small part of the, of the tumor, or it can be a small part of the, some organ like uh, brain or like spleen, okay? So let's imagine we don't need a special information. The next thing that you need to do with your tissue, you can freeze it or you can proceed it when it's fresh. So it's better to proceed with a fresh tissue, of course. So the next step that you may do is the dissociation of the tissue. There are a lot of techniques depending on the organ that you're working with. For example, if you are working with spleen, it can be even uh, okay if you just uh, press your tissue and then chunk it a little bit, and then you have a dissociated tissue in your case. If you're working with brain, it's a little bit harder and because it's mainly very fatty and that's why it's, you need some uh, enzymes to dissociate the tissue. So the tissue dissociation depends very hardly on the type of tissue you're working with, but the, at the end, your goal is to reach a cell suspension, yeah, to come from the solid state into the liquid state. And after you did it, you can fax or max your cells in order to get only the healthy cells out of it, the cells that are not dying. And when you prepared this cell suspension, you can load it onto the 10X Chromium controller or with the fax using SmartSec library preparation workflow if you don't have so much money. So this is basically the workflow that you need to consider whether you when you don't need the spatial information of your sample. When you need to, when you need uh, the spatial information of your sample, it's getting a little bit harder. Yeah, because you have two components in that case. You need a messenger RNA information and also the spatial information where the cell is seated in the tissue. So the question that you might ask yourself in that case are, firstly, how much money do you have? Secondly, what is the resolution that you seek to have? And thirdly, the throughput that you want to gain. So if you don't have so much money, and if the throughput is not so, it's not so, it's not so important for you, but you want to gain a high resolution, you are going with this left path. On the other hand, if you have a lot of money and you want to have high throughput, really a lot of data generated by a little bit lower resolution, you can go with the right path in that case. So let's start here with the left part. Let's, let's start with the case that you have a little bit less money. Uh, you will gain a less, little bit less throughput, but you would have really high resolution. What are the techniques that can be offered in that case? So in that case, you can use the technique that is called laser capture micro dissection. So that is a technique that allows you practically to cut out the cells out of your sliced tissue and then proceed with the processing of these cutted cells. So how does it work? Firstly, you need to slice your tissue into the 10 micrometer slices and then uh, put them onto the slides. You can stain the slides according to the staining you need. You can, immune, you, you can do an immune fluorescency staining. You can do a simple HE staining. You can do uh, also some other types of the immune histochemistry. It depends only on the target cells, yeah, which markers does this, uh, do these target cells uh, um, have on their surface or inside of them. So when you stained your tissue on your slides, you may proceed to the actual laser capture micro dissection. And you can see as example here, a, a microscope that has also a robo arm, like a specific robotic arm and a laser that allows you to cut out the cells out of the tissue. So how does it work? Firstly, your laser is coming in some cases from, uh, from, from the side, on the other cases from uh, behind of this slide, but um, you need a laser that is cutting out your tissue that is 10 micrometers thick on the slide. So when the tissue is cut out, it jumps out on the top and the robotic arm is carrying the tube with a tube cap. So that means when you're cutting your tissue, the robotic arm is coming to the slide, placing the tube cap above the slide. And then after you cut it, your tissue, this cut it tissue just jumps out and stays sticking onto the tube, tube cap. Yeah, so that means the tissue that you cut it out here will jump out and then stick on the tube cap. So that means that 
when you can when you look inside into the microscope that is something that we were doing also in our department you can see here for example cells stained with in the blue channel with DAPI and two other proteins in red and green channel. And our question was just to cut out the cells that are in red and the ones that are around the red ones in the green channel. So basically you can target the areas of the size whenever you want. You can target, for example, even two or three cells. Here you can target one single cell you can target three or five cells, bunches. It doesn't matter. It just depends on the tissue that you have. And after the cutting out the tissue, it looks like this. So basically you are cutting the slices out of the slide. And afterward, they're just jumping on, out into your tube cap. So with this technique, you can reach really high amount, a high resolution because you can target even single cells or a packets of two or three cells. But on the other hand, the throughput is not so big. Yeah, that means that you need to cut out each and every cell in different tube caps and then proceed with the tube caps. So you can imagine how much work it is and that the throughput is not so high. There are some questions when you need such high resolution. Yeah, for example, if you are working with um, vessels, yeah, for example, in the stroke, in the stroke disease, um, there are some questions when you want to just uh, um, to, to, to investigate the cells that are invading the central nervous system out of the bloodstream, yeah? That you need to target only one single cell that is, that is going through the endothelium. So that means in that case, you need something that has a very high, high resolution and the laser capture microdissection would be something that can be offered in that case. Or um, the other types of the diseases like uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. You would have in such a type, in such diseases, only 1% of cells that are really malignant and 99% in your sample would be the cells that are non-malignant and belong to the microenvironment of this tumor. And in that case, you might to consider to cut out your cells out of the tissue because that would be only the packets of, of one or two cells that are localized among 99% of the other cells that are in microenvironment. So plan your experiment, think about what cells do you target, if you need a high resolution or not, because it can depend on which method you will be using. So what do we do after cutting out our cells? As I said, the cut cells will be jumping out into the tube cap and will stick there. So that means we can proceed with the tube cap as if it would be our well with a single cell or with a packet of some cells in it. And um, we can use, for example, a smart sac library preparation or call that I have been describing before. You can make a, an, a single cDNA gene expression library out of the tube cap when you are performing the smart sac protocol inside of the tube cap. And then you will gain an information about each and every cell that you cut it out. So basically what you are doing, you will target the messenger RNA that is contained in this tube cap. You will do the reverse transcription of this messenger RNA. You will produce the cDNA. Afterwards, you can amplify your cDNA, make small fragments and purify it till the step that you are gaining your gene expression library. And afterwards you can send it for sequencing and be happy about your results. So this is the technique that is allowing you a high resolution, a low throughput, but which comes with low cost on the, in this case. So when we are coming to the next topic, what happens if we have high costs, if we um, want to have a high throughput, a lot of information gained, but we can deal with a lower resolution. So there are some commercial, commercial products available, for example, 10X Visium special DIN expression products. So how does it work? This commercial products work in this way that you would have a special slides with capture areas in it. So in each of the capture areas, you can put a slice of your tissue. And when we are looking inside of the capture areas, you would see that each of the capture areas is barcoded with 5,000 barcoded spots. Okay, so that means that you will have on the capture area, a lot of dots that are marked inside and are in the amount of 5,000 per capture area. These dots 
as you can see, they are we, they are uh, they contain a lot of the primer sequencings that are that are looking out out of the dot, and that carry on the special barcode sequence, the UMI sequence, and the PolyDT sequence. So as you see, it sounds a little bit familiar what we uh, what we saw before. But the only difference to the 10x uh, suspension-based uh, suspension based workflow is that you don't have any of the uh, beats here. Yeah, You have just uh, dots that have a lot of the primers uh, sticking out of the dot. So the other case is that the, this barcoded spot has only 50 micrometers in diameter. So that means that the um, information that you will get out of this spot will be bulked. Yeah, that's, that's something that we need to consider about that I've told you about the lower resolution because when you imagine um, a, a normal T lymphocyte would have around 10, 11 micrometers in diameter. So that means you can have even five or even seven cells that will be binding onto the one barcoded spot. So it's not a single cell resolution, it's barely uh, pseudo bulk resolution in that case, because you will have uh, five to seven cells per spot. And there will be not so much possibilities and not so much cases where you will have only one cell per spot. So you can say it's single cell resolution, okay? So you need to consider whether you wanna use it, but it's a nice technique because it has really high throughput and a lot of data generated but you need to consider whether you want to work with uh, 50 micrometers resolution. So in each of the dot, you will have the primers. So what do these primers do? Let's take a look at the, at the workflow. The first one, you need the fresh frozen tissue. Okay, so that means that the tissue that was fresh frozen and then sliced into the 10 micrometer slices. In the future, um, it will be also available to proceed with the formalin fixed tissues, that's also very cool, but uh, the commercial kits are not available now, but I assume that maybe in this or in the next year that will be, they will be available and 10X is working on it. But now you can work mostly only with the fresh frozen tissue. So you make a 10 micrometer slices out of your fresh frozen tissue and push, put it onto the capture area, as you can see it here on the picture. The next thing that you make with your tissue is just to permeabilize it. Yeah? Permeabilization of the tissue means that the membranes are more leaky and that the messenger molecules, messenger RNA molecules that are contained in the cells, that they can just reach out, out of, this, of the tissue and bind to other primers. Yeah? Because the spots, they are below the tissue. So that means we can capture our messenger RNA molecules by these barcoded spots. And that's why gain a spatial information about the messenger RNA that is contained in our sample. So the next step would be the conventional ones that we saw like five or six times today. Yeah, you will do the reverse transcription PCR out of your messenger RNA. You will amplify fragment, purify your, uh, your DNA library and afterwards you get your gene expression library, but in that case, spatial expression library. On the other hand, you can do an imaging of the same tissue slice that you used for the messenger RNA uh, targeting. So that means in parallel, you are doing a, an imaging. And at the end, when you have your data, it looks like this. It means you have an image and you have also the information of all of the barcoded spots that are here um, that are contained into the, in the capture area. And you can plot each and every gene and then look into the areas that, are, that you are interested in and afterwards um, cluster your cells um, um, according to the spatial information in that case too. So a very nice technique, allowing you a high throughput that you can use and um, allowing you to gain a messenger RNA information of each of the spot that is contained in this area and also preserves the special information for your, for your uh, research, which may be very, very useful. For example, when you discover some brain slices here where the architecture of the tissue is very important to preserve for you. So let's summarize everything that we have talked about now. We talked about the solid tissue 
And the next question that you need to ask yourself whether you need this special information. If you don't need this information, you must dissociate your tissue and afterwards you have a single cell suspension that is ready for sorting, for isolation, and where you can consider whether you wanna work with the 10X protocol or for example, with the SmartSec protocol. If you need special information, you need to slice your tissue. And afterwards, you might think about the resolution, the budget and the throughput that you would have. If the resolution is the case for you, if you need a very high resolution and you are dealing with low budget and low throughput, then you might use the laser capture micro dissection and afterwards the smart sac library preparation. If the resolution uh, is okay for you, if it's a little bit lower and you have a lot of money and can um, then gain a high throughput, you might use the 10x Visium library preparation workflow. So on that point, I would take a look into the chat because you have a lot of uh, questions put it and maybe some of them may May, it may be better to discuss them here. So the first one is that if staining affect the cell behavior, does it impact on reproducibility among different cell types? The staining um, can interfere with your messenger RNA quality a lot. That is something that you need to consider because the staining that you would use is very, very quick staining because the messenger RNA is very unstable. So that's why you need to do a quick staining and the one that will not interfere with your messenger RNA. For example, you cannot, uh, you cannot fix your slices with PFA uh, in that case, because PFA will just disrupt all the RNA and DNA integrity in your case. So you might consider maybe some other fixing solutions like uh, acetone, yeah? That's something that can be used in that case that can fix your proteins and that will not dis disrupt your RNA integrity. So um, can spherical cells will be with phenotypic characteristic be micro dissected? How much laser can affect the gene expression of single cells? You must understand that the laser is something that, is, uh, that will last maybe a few seconds. Yeah, so that means there where you are cutting out, you will destroy everything, but on the middle that you cut it out, you will preserve everything that you had. The time that you are lasering your tissue is not enough to, uh, to, to affect the, uh, the quality of your RNA if you are doing it quick. So does the laser capture micro dissection kills the cells? What power and wavelength do you need to use to not damage the cells? Uh, basically, the thing, the thing is that on the, on, the, on the edge that you are cutting out, it's not killing the cells, but uh, it's, sorry, it's killing the cells on the edge, but the, everything that we need to have is in the middle. So that's why it will be preserved by the, by the, by the cutting out. So maybe I will answer one more question that we are in time today. For example, um, like the question about, um, Is it okay to store the cell's tissue in RNA later, a kind of tissue storing reagent for single cell RNA seq analysis? Uh, you can store your tissue, you can fresh froze your tissue and then store it in minus 80, and it will not affect uh, the quality of the RNA molecules too much. Yeah, you can really do it, and then afterwards you can uh, proceed with this tissue. But that is something that it's very good that you ask it because this is the next part of our. Of our, of our workflow today, uh, namely what happens if you have the preserved tissue. So what happens if you have tissue that was frozen before or processed in the other way? Well, let's talk about it, about the processing with the preserved tissue. And this is something that can vary a lot that you can, that you can try with the, some alternative methods and that might be um, developing really fast in the next years. As you, as you saw, for example, 10 x Visium will have, uh, as they said, they claimed the FFPE method to work uh, with the tissues. And in this case, when you work with the preserved tissue, it's, you, you need really to stack on the trend that is going now. And maybe there are some methods that we, can, that, that we didn't even describe today, but they, they will emerge tomorrow, yeah? But my personal, uh, my personal recommendation for you when you're working with preserved tissue, you might consider 
not to work with the single cells. Uh, when you're working with the preserved tissue that was solid, it might be better even to, to, to think about whether you work better with nuclear. So that is something new today. Uh, nuclear, as you know, uh, are, um, they, they, they consist not only from the DNA, they are consistent too from, of the RNA molecules. So that means um, the nuclei would have also an enough amount of the RNA for us to build an, a, a gene expression profile library. So when you're working with preserved tissue, it's really a great, um, a great challenge for you. And you might consider to use not a single cell separation, but a single nuclear isolation. So there are some methods where you can dissociate your solid tissue into the, uh, into the separate nuclei. And afterwards, when you have this uh, nuclear suspension, you can sort them. You can take a look whether the nuclei are in good quality. You can DAPI sort them and sort only that ones that have a good signal. So in that case, you are doing a quality control. And afterwards, when you have your nuclei suspension, you can proceed to the 10X chromium chip controller and with the usual 10X protocol. So the next step, what you will do is just a rest transcription PCR of this messenger and also pre-messenger RNA that is contained in the nuclei. And afterwards, you convert this into the cDNA, you amplify, fragment, and purify it till you get your gene expression library. So that is something that might work out for you if you are working like with the brain tissue. It's really hard to work with the frozen brain tissue that, uh, that's stored for some time in the minus 80. In that case, you might consider to either to go better into the direction of the nuclear isolation, because in that case, you are, you are certain about that you will isolate really the separate nuclei of separate cells, yeah? Because when you consider to isolate and separate cells from the brain tissue, that means that you would deal with some cell types that, are, that have a lot of the um, parts of the cells that are, that are very spiky and that are very sticky and that it's really hard to sort and to dissociate appropriately. Yeah. So that's why in that case, you might consider not to concentrate yourself on these cells, but to concentrate yourself better on something that is a little bit smaller, but gives you enough information about the gene expression library, namely nuclei. So let's take a look at the missing part of the scheme that we, will, that we were using before. So in that case, when you're working with the preserved tissue, you might think about to isolate the nuclei and not the cells. And afterwards, you need to quality control them to separate dead nuclei from the healthy nuclei. And um, then you might use fax or mixing techniques and you can proceed to the usual 10X library preparation workflow. As I said, the quality of cells matters. Sometimes you're working really with the very sticky cells uh, like macrophages or for example, oligodendrocytes and so on. And in that case, you might really consider, even if it's fresh tissue, to isolate nuclei because it will grant you that you will isolate from each and every single cell the part that contains enough of the RNA. So that was it. That was the protocol, um, the general workflow that, um, that you might use in your research afterwards. I hope that is that helps somebody of you also to think about the planning of your experiments. As I said, we don't speak to be, we don't seek to be one hundred percent complete and to, um, and to 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 talk about all of the methods that are available now. We focused only on the few of them, but I hope really that this information helped you a little bit more to understand the methods and also to understand what is appropriate to use in one or in the another case. So on this part, I would kindly ask you to do something for us. And namely, I would be uh, very happy with, and also all the whole uh, genomics team would be also very happy if you could evaluate our seminar today, because that is a possibility for us to make the material better. We are happy about all of the feedback that we can gain from you. 
the negative and the positive well, uh, feedback as well are really, really very welcome. And uh, we would be really very happy to hear from you and to see from you what uh, what are your impressions, what are your suggestions, and the uh, overall about your feedback about this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. You can contact me every time that you want. And the links for the feedback would be uh, also duplicated into the chats in the Slack and also in Zoom and YouTube. Um, we will head to the uh, directly to the Q&A in one or two minutes and we'll try to answer your questions that you that you were uh, putting us throughout the talk. So thank you once more for your attention and um, I hope that you liked our talk today. Yeah, thank you for this love. It was a very uh, informative explanation on how to approach this important step. So we have extreme amount of questions. <clears throat> Uh, but most of this QA session, as we said, will be performed in uh, Slack. Yeah, so thanks a lot, especially to the people who already wrote questions on Slack, which means that less work, work for us. However, we were trying to catch the questions from them as well. So um, uh, the links for the evaluation form are actually already published on Zoom, Slack, YouTube, and I think that's all. Uh, so Thanks again for your feedback, which you will provide us hopefully. I propose now we will speak through a few questions of the QA sessions and we'll see if there are more questions after that. Mm -hmm. So the first one was quite general and I decided it would be great to discuss it after the both lectures. Uh, would, would one be correct to assume that it would be better to start with, to start with bulk, bulk seek and then confirm observations with a single set, single single self sequencing experiments. What do you think about it? I tried to answer that question in Slack already. So as as a um, settings of our QA session, it will be like the summarized questions and the replies in the thread. But in brief, to make a recap. Uh, from my point of view, there is uh, quite tricky to do the validation of bulk experiments in single cell because in single cell you actually approach the single re resolution and try to observe the processes which, which happens in uh, every independent cell. So quite often you do uh, opposite, uh, like vice versa approach that you analyze something on single cell. Uh, you might also capture your cell of interest into one uh, group and then do bulk sequencing to that because bulk sequencing uh, in average have, uh, has more statistical power. But this uh, um, approach when you try to uh, apply single cell sequencing, which is more uh, expensive to the uh, bulk uh, RNA uh, experiment, uh, bulk sequencing RNA exp experiment is not so suitable from my point of view. Yeah, and uh, it's actually very field specific, but it's often you can find that there is a lot of publicly available bulk seek experiments already done, and you can evaluate them. However, there might, might be not enough single cell sequencing done yet with your specific treatment or with your specific organ at all. For example, with liver, there is not that much of those. So, for example, for my for my experiments, I would not start with bulk seek just because I can already analyze public data. However, I can't analyze public single cell data. That's why I am. Uh, generating it uh, on my own. And I think it can be also true for some other fields. So check your fields, check your disease and send it out. There is uh, a question in Zoom now, where do you check that public data? I think that ah, the, the, best, okay. the, best, the best way uh, to check it would be to look either into the publication. There is a, in, a lot of the publication that share their data on some public repositories like Geo datasets. This is something that where you can find a lot of the public datasets uh, in um, in the um, published there and uh, uploaded there. Yeah, EGA or Geo. Yeah, are the best yeah. ones. Yeah. So very simple. Uh, every publication in a good proper journal would contain the number of the ascension, uh, which is, for example, GSE number something. And if you go to the gene expression omnibus or GEO, you will most likely find it. The second source would be the European Nucleotide Archive. 
uh, and sometimes there are some country specific. For example, there is an archive in China, or there are some small databases related only to single cell. So usually every publication contains this data availability section. Yeah. And I will highlight it on my uh, Friday session as well, like how to proceed, uh, proceed uh, they already published a data set because uh, for some part of publication, they uh, authors also developed the Shiny app or some kind of web tool to operate with this data to discover expression profile and on different cells and other fancy features. Yeah. Uh, so actually, a lot of questions were already answered by Marina, and you can if you can check the the Slack just in case if your question was was there. Uh, however, some questions very were, were very specific to to the topic that Vladislav mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, one of those: How do you deal with microglioplasticity uh, while sorting for sequencing? Or put it another way: How do you know for sure that this sort of population is in particular state? Um, well when we are talking about the microglia, you mean, or what? Yeah, so the question is regarding the yeah. microglia. Yeah, so basically, when you are targeting some of the cell populations in brain tissue, so microglia, for all of, of you that don't know, that it is a cell population in the brain that has a particular immunological functions in our brain, and the, it is a myeloid-like cell population that is residing in the brain. And um, microglia cells, they can, of course, change their state from the naive into the activated state when, for example, there is some inflammation going on in the site of the tissue where this microglia resides. So the question was, uh, how do you, uh, how do you, how can you um, see whether, what is the state of this microglia cell and uh, if it is microglia cell at all? I think this is this this question would be better to answer in the workshop that we will do at sat on Saturday and on Sunday because um, the major the 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 major uh, point in that case would be that that what are the gene expression profiles that are presented by this microglia when you see some typical markers of the microglia. Uh, are being expressed in one particular plast cluster of the cells. And when you see that on top of this typical microglia clusters, you would have some activational markers for phagocytosis and so on and so on, you can really be uh, very sure about that A, it is microglia and B, it is activated. But you can answer this question only in that case when you, uh, when you analyze your data properly and when you uh, retrieve all of the markers that can describe this population the best. Yeah, thank you. And actually, personally, I very much enjoyed the discussion regarding the Fox versus Max. Mm -hmm. I, I just believe that this is a discussion they had already a few a few months ago, probably. And, mm -hmm. and, and I just imagine that any scientist who decided in the cell sorting are uh, actually thinking through that. Uh, I also would like to say that it's quite a field specific. I have no idea how that how that is in uh, neurology, uh, neuro neurological um sorting, for example, but uh, according to the publications in the liver sorting, effects gives more than 98%-ish uh, purity of the cell population approximately, when max gives approximately 90-ish. I think it's quite difficult to measure the true numbers. However, and now it will be a scary thing for Penex, your cell population shouldn't be 100% pure. I mean, it would be nice, of course, but you have such many cells that you can just filter out a few dozens or hundred cells and just analyze the ones we, we need. Yeah. However, I would think it's much more important for smart seed, right? Because we have quite a few number of cells. So I mean, when, I... when you are using a smart seed, you should consider whether you want to have a single cell resolution or mm -hmm. whether you want to do a bulk. So uh, when you do a bulk, it is okay when you max yeah. your tissue before and then you have some portion of the cells that were enriched for it. And uh, when you want to have really a single cell uh, 92 well played <laughs> that means that you can do it only with the facts you can you cannot do it basically with max sort exactly so it's technically impossible and of course it should be as pure <laughs> as possible nothing yeah. to filter out not that much yeah. uh, 
Um, and then the next, th there's one question regarding the single nuclei, very specific questions. So one person isolates uh, PBM, uh, PBMC cells with limb prep and freeze them uh, as cell suspension in DMSO. Mm -hmm. So what do you recommend to isolate single nuclei and, and proceed with that, or it's fine to work with uh, okay. the whole cells? I think that I even answered this question privately in Zoom now, but oh. I can repeat <laughs> it for all of the people. So basically PBMC, uh, is a very thankful tissue type to work with. Yeah, it's PBMCs, as we said before, that is isolated mononuclear population of the whole blood containing lymphocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, and some smaller dendritic cells populations and so on. So uh, when you store it in DMSO in amount of like five or six millions per cryotube, and then uh, putting it appropriately in minus 80 for a few days in isopropanol, and then afterwards you put it into the liquid nitrogen, that means that you can store it for years. <laughs> like when we, we are working a lot of PB, with PBMCs in our department, and I can say that from PBMCs, when you, uh, when you, when you are working with them, even if they were frozen before, you can, uh, you can really just tow it up uh, stain it for some fax antibodies, fax it through for viability dye and all of the cell population that you need. And you can really do a single cell suspensions out of the PBMCs that were really frozen for a long period of time. When it's done properly, when the uh, fixation and when the freezing steps were done properly and it were stored in the liquid nitrogen without defreezing and so on, uh, you can really isolate even single cells after the towing up this tissue and work with single cells from the PBMCs. The only yeah. thing is just you need to sort them for viability dye to separate that from not that and then enrich for your cell population. So it's a very practical question, which raises a question uh, again, the topic that we are happy to have people with different backgrounds and projects in our community. So thanks for this interesting topic. Um, there is also one question which I as well was asked privately. So for pharmacogenomic studies, single cell or bulk seek, what is more important? So I don't know how you guys think, but I think they just have slightly different applications. So it, the, it more depends on which question I'm investigating. If, if bulk seek resolution is not enough to answer your question, then the sing single cell is the way to go. It's abund uh, if, if it's not that important for you, that maybe you can focus on bulk seek. Yeah. yeah, like I have the one preliminary answer because yeah, I also was wondering how to apply my single cell experiment in order to reach advanced pharmacogenomics uh, reports. So actually uh, one of these uh, hyped uh, strategies to use single cell analysis output is to uh, be able to target particular cell type. So actually zoom in into your organ of interest and uh, figure out the uh, mechanism of drug action on the cell type uh, uh, comparable to the tissue type, like type of tissue. That is why single cell uh, technologies are very uh, intriguing and uh, could suit uh, to the pharmacogenomic studies, uh, in particular to understand uh, gene regulatory network and also some of uh, effects of uh, drug uh, uh, which uh, um, target different pathways activated in different cells. So actually it's very relevant, but nowadays there are not so many uh, data available or like it's still under the development process. However, I found one publication which uh, applies um, uh, different pharmacogenomic studies and try to reconstruct uh, or like predict uh, a response on the different drug on a different cell line. So it was made uh, on the bulk sequencing data, but it's clear that you can apply it to the single cell as well. It's just because of, uh, it's just the question of expression profile. So please write the message in the Slack that uh, I will do my best to find this paper. Yep. So among the questions, there is also one very practical uh, regarding the, the micro dissections with laser. Um, mm -hmm. Just let me find it. Ah, damn. I think I lost it. So it was about the patch seek, I guess. Uh, yes, so comparing this laser cutting technique with patch seek, which I'm not familiar with, to be honest, which one would have the better quality of data? So uh, anybody would like to comment on that? With batch seek? I oh, know it's patch seek, like patch. Uh, yeah. 
So I, I, I wasn't working with this technique, so I must fully <laughs> just, just honestly say that I cannot answer this question because um, I cannot say from the personal experience what would be better in that case. But so maybe, maybe if somebody of you were working with that. Maybe here we can just refer to the slide which Marina showed. This is, you know, dozens of different techniques of sequencing yeah, exactly. and different applications of those. And you can imagine how many technical differences are there. So I have even no idea how much it works. I'm very sorry <laughs> that we cannot answer this specific question. Uh, but yeah, so maybe if somebody from the community have worked with that, maybe maybe somebody could provide the answer for the new one channel. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, there is uh, one more interesting question and I will right now try to find it. So any suggestions related to the multiplexing would be any major difference in techniques like CT-seq and multi-seq, which again, I never watched this to be honest. With the amount of what? Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so the question is, uh, any suggestions related to multiplexing? And there is also a question regarding two techniques. I will just put it on the Zoom chat, uh, CT seek and multi seek. Yeah. Any major differences? I mean, yeah, so we will talk about site seek uh, apparently the at the ne next day of our course. So that means on Wednesday we will talk a lot about the site seek. Um, I must ask the person to specify a little bit the question whether you mean that you want to have like three or four sample in one batch and then demultiplex them? Or are you talking about the just a normal uh, targeting of the cell sulfurase proteins in that case? So the good, uh, the good point is that you still receive many answers regarding site seek uh, on the following batch. So I propose to stay tuned. Uh, and there's also one question, the terminological one regarding high versus low resolution. So if you have high resolution, normally you have more information and it is, and it is high budget. Is it correct? Um, what I was trying to compare is, for example, the resolution of the LCM and the cost that comes with it with the resolution of, for example, 10x Visium and with the cost that can come with this method. And basically, if I may go some slides backwards, I can show it to you. So basically when you are working with the LCM, you can gain a high resolution. You can really cut single cells with the help of this laser, but the throughput and the costs in that case are low. Yeah, because the throughput means that you need to cut out each and every cell and then process with each and every tube. The costs are also low because you don't use the 10x uh, kit in that way. You can use smart seek kits that are uh, that are that uh, that don't cost so much as 10x kits. On the other hand, you can go with the high cost with high throughput with the help of the 10x kits, but the resolution is there a little bit lower because of the diameter of this barcoded spot. Yeah, in the 10x vision, the diameter of the spot is 50 micrometers. So that means that the resolution that you can get is lower as you would do it with the LCM. But on the other hand, you're processing the whole capture area at once. So that means the throughput that you are targeting with one experiment is really high. Okay. Uh, also, there, was, there were some questions already discussed in the first part. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, okay, so we have the one more question. I think we can actually uh, prepare to close the session, but maybe we'll discuss it as well. Do you suggest employing comb uh, combinatorial methods like split seek and share seek? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think that really, let's say it's like this. Uh, there are so much methods. There are so so many different approaches, and you, uh, as I said before, the workflow the, that, we are, that we are suggesting today is not the one that includes all of them. And of course, there is some space for improvising. Yeah, you can uh, do whenever you want. The only thing is you need just to see whether it is compatible with your experiment or not. As you can see, this scheme is already a little bit uh, complicated, <laughs> and, but it contains only like three or four methods that we described today. And uh, of course you can improvise in all the ways that you want and combine a lot of different techniques. 
and uh, to make a little advertisement, uh, today we talk only about the messenger RNA targeting techniques. Yeah, that we talked about RNA sequencing. Uh, on the next day of our course, we will talk about the techniques that can come on top of it. Yeah, the techniques that can interfere with uh, proteins. Yeah, like SiteSeq or the ones that interfere either with the DNA, uh, like ataxic and so on. So just stay tuned, really come to our next, uh, to, to our next course day. And I, I will say we will not be disappointed about the amount of techniques that you co can combine only with these two or three techniques that we described now. I think we should all tell you really thanks. Thank you for not putting all the techniques on the scheme because otherwise, I guess it would be impossible to read it <laughs> with all the diversity and hundred different approaches. <laughs> yeah, I cannot imagine combining all of those. Yeah, uh, nevertheless, uh, I think it was quite a nice, a nice session and we're already over time for 15 minutes, which means that yeah. Thank you, Vladislav and Marina, for still staying with us here. And uh, I think we will have some more questions. So feel free to write them on the day one. And whenever uh, you know our lecturers have, have some coffee break, uh, they relax after the lectures. If they will have some time, they I think will help you and answer the field of questions. Yeah. And of course, if you are watching us on the on the recording, feel free to join the Slack to ask the questions. We are all available. And Vladislav and Marina both have provided their uh, contacts for private questions as well, if you want to write them. Yeah. Uh, I would say also yeah. something to the end, because we have really a lot of the participants, a lot of the toughest ones that even overstand the whole Q&A session. So thank you from my side to you too. And one thing is that I wanted also to say to you, um, if you want to really plan your experiment on your own, or if you want to do it a little bit more interactive, we have like a small, small, uh, small home task for you. Maybe some of you are uh, in the planning phase of their experiments, and maybe some of you are thinking about it in their projects. So feel free to contact us. It would be really nice if you, for example, could prepare a little plan of your workflow and share it with us and we can discuss it with you afterwards privately and uh, give you our advices on that behalf. So just feel free to contact us. It would be really cool to hear a little bit more from you. And as I said, uh, you can really make your workflow, share it with us, and then we can help to make it even better. So if there are any liver persons, I will be happy to help. And I promise not to use your ideas and to help you as much as I can. I have also a last word from my side. So uh, we thank our participants and like, it's very lovely to, uh, to get this uh, thanks from them as well. But I would like to thank uh, all of the Genomics UA team who supports us today and during the school. So yeah, I think it's our collaborative effort. And I think that we might cancel our today's session on this yeah. positive. Let's close it. And guys, see you next on the next program's day. Please refer to the general channel. Then you there we will find the program uh, program link to the at, 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 in the pin, in the pinned messages. So there you will find the date, the time of the beginning of the next session, as well as the Zoom link. So please. Uh, join us next time as well. Prepare your toughest questions to us and we're of course happy to see you again and again. Thank you all. See you and bye-bye.